She was America's first woman in space, and she worked to inspire young girls and boys to follow in her footsteps. Sally Ride has passed away in La Jolla. I'm Eric Anderson. Tonight on KPBS Evening Edition, a look at Sally Ride's career and legacy. And I'm Peggy Pico. In tonight's roundtable, the suspected shooter in the Colorado massacre appeared stoic and possibly sedated during his first court appearance. Criminal and mental health experts weigh in on his demeanor. Plus, California has some of the strictest gun laws in the country, but do they really protect us any better than Colorado laws? And the county's only licensed medical marijuana dispensary is fighting to stay put tonight. KPBS Evening Edition starts now. Good evening and thanks for joining us. Dwayne Brown has the night off. Sally Ride, the first American woman in space, has died. She died in La Jolla today after a 17-month battle with pancreatic cancer. Ride was working on her doctoral degree in physics in 1977 when she answered a NASA ad for astronauts. Six years later, she flew on the shuttle Challenger. Ride took a second trip aboard the Challenger a year later. After leaving NASA, Ride became a physics professor at UC San Diego. She was a guest on the KPBS program Full Focus in 2005. Host Gloria Penner asked her about one special moment in space, and here was her answer. It would be looking back at Earth, which is an absolutely spectacular view. And I'm from California, so I was particularly interested in looking back down at California at night. And we had one great orbit on my second flight that went uh, up the coast of California at night. And I was able to see uh, San Diego, Los Angeles, where I grew up, and uh, the San Francisco Bay Area, wh where I went to school. NASA says that Sally Ride literally changed the face of the space program, and President Obama today called her a national hero. She was recently inducted into the International Hall of Fame at San Diego's Air and Space Museum. In addition to her work at UC San Diego, Ride created a company called Sally Ride Science to help encourage youngsters to pursue careers in science, technology, engineering, and math. Tomorrow on KPBS Midday Edition, we'll talk with some of the scientists who work with her on that goal. That's at noon on 89.5 FM. The suspect in the Colorado movie theater shootings made his first court appearance this morning. 24-year-old James Holmes appeared dazed and did not speak during the hearing. Prosecutors say they don't know if he's on any medication. They're also not saying whether they'll pursue the death penalty. Holmes is accused of killing 12 people and wounding dozens of others during a midnight showing of The Dark Knight Rises last Friday. Holmes was born and raised here in San Diego and his family still lives here. Today, Holmes's mother released a statement through her attorney. KPBS reporter Kyla Calvert was there. Kyla, what did uh, Arlene Holmes say about uh, her statement? Well, Holmes said she wanted to clarify what she told the ABC reporter who called her home early on Friday, mor early on Friday morning. She is widely quoted as having said, you have the right person. And she says that when she said that, she was only identifying herself as the mother of James Holmes. She wasn't saying that she thought the police had arrested the right person, as some have implied. So after she identified herself, she said she then asked the reporter why he was calling. And he told me about a shooting in Aurora. He asked for a comment. I told him I could not comment because I did not know if the person he was talking about was my son, and I would need to find out. Now, Kylie, did the attorney uh, ask for any new information about the family or their relationship with their son? The family's attorney, Lisa Damiani, said she couldn't comment on the family's relationship with, with their son, but she did say that they have not seen him since his arrest, um, that they have spoken with local FBI agents here in San Diego, and she said that they wanted to reiterate that their hearts go out to the victims and their families and that they ask that their privacy be respected. KPBS reporter Kyla Calvert. Tragedies like Friday's shooting always raise questions of why and what could anyone have done. We'll be looking at those questions in just a few minutes. 
Supporters of San Diego County's only licensed medical marijuana dispensary hope a federal court will help them fight eviction. The Mother Earth Alternative Healing Cooperative serves 70,000 patients, but will have to vacate its home near Gillespie Field tomorrow. The cooperative wants to stay in business while they launch a legal fight for their future. Bob Bergstrom is a Navy veteran who lives with muscular dystrophy. The muscle crippling disease is painful, and Uncle Bob, as he calls himself, gets relief from medical marijuana. He's a patient and a volunteer at the East County's only licensed medical marijuana dispensary. And these guys let me hang out there and check people in, and you know, we're actually worth do something with my life. And all that's going to go away again. What are we supposed to do? So what they're basically asking the federal court to do is to step in, stop the eviction, so that they can continue to operate the business while the appeal is underway. If Mother Earth is forced to close down pending appeal, um, there will be no Mother Earth. So the stay is really what makes or breaks uh, this uh, uh, legal fight, um, because Mother Earth will not be around for the year or two years it takes to fight the appeal. Lance Rogers says the court should act quickly because the eviction is imminent. But not everyone wants the business to stay open. John Redmond says state law doesn't permit people to sell marijuana for money. He says there is no mention of cooperatives or collectives as places in the measure that allows for medical marijuana. And when you have a storefront dispensary, now all of a sudden you've turned it into a noun and you've broken state law. And then when a city then says, oh, well, then we'll collect taxes on it, you've now sanctioned it by a government, which is not what Prop 215 said at all, in any way, shape, or form. If the legal move fails, Mother Earth supporters say they will immediately appeal. There was no comment today from the U.S. Attorney's Office. What makes someone commit heinous crimes like Friday's theater massacre? Is there a pattern or behavioral clue that was missed? Peggy Pico talks with mental health experts at the roundtable. Colorado shooting suspect James Holmes appeared sedated in court today, but no one has confirmed his mental health status or history. However, a recent study by the Secret Service says mass killers don't typically snap, they plan. To talk about the issue is Wendy Patrick, SDSU School of Business, former trial attorney and co-author of the revised bestseller Reading People, and David Peters. He's a licensed family psychotherapist with a private practice in Mission Valley. Thank you both for being here. Wendy, in your book, you say you can read people. What is your first reading or impression of uh, James Holmes? I wish I had more to work with. I think that's what a lot of people are saying is we've got some, some very interesting video footage when he was 18 where he doesn't look that unnatural. He looks pretty normal. Then we've got what's been described as an incredibly creepy voicemail message on his answering machine. So we, there's these two points in time. We want to know more about what happened in the interim. What, what was he doing? What did he look like? Who were his friends? If he had any, right. if he wasn't so socially withdrawn, it would be also great to have a social media presence to work with. We still haven't found that if it exists. So right now what we're struggling with is the absence of information that perhaps would have allowed us to read red flags that would have been there in the last couple of years. Yeah, and no baseline, no comparison. David, a lot of people are trying to make sense of this. Hindsight is twenty twenty. People are tossing out mental health terms, things like schizophrenia. Uh, what is schizophrenia briefly, and is this typical behavior of a schizophrenic? Well, we should say, of course, at the beginning, we don't know much more than we do know, and so it could be a number of different things. But if it was a mental illness, uh, we should know the majority of people with severe mental illnesses are victims of crime. They're not perpetrators of crime. Uh, in some rare instances, yes, someone who is experiencing delusions, uh, paranoid delusions, could it be motivated, if they had auditory hallucinations telling them to do so, they could be motivated toward violence. So with schizophrenia, you have someone who, over time, becomes more socially withdrawn. They don't enjoy social interaction. If it's paranoid schizophrenia, they would have a delusion that maybe they are special, maybe they're Jesus, maybe they're a prophet or something, or maybe they're the joker in this case. Uh, and they would have perhaps auditory hallucinations, command hallucinations, which tell the person, the voice in their head tells them to do certain things. But that's really slim. It's like a 99 to 1 per, it's very, very, very small percentage of schizophrenics who have this, this type of... Uh, yes, by and large, someone who's suffering schizophrenia is more a victim of violence on the street than they are a perpetrator of violence. 
Mm -hmm. Right. Definitely. Um, I was going to say, so Holmes' mother is reported as saying, uh, ABC mm -hmm. News called her, and she said, yes, you've got the right person when she was first told about these shootings. I'm going to ask you both this first. Wendy, what does that say to you? Can you imagine if the police showed up at your house and told you that your son or daughter had done something like this, what your first reaction would be? It is absolutely stunning and telling that her first reaction was, you've got the right guy. It tells us that this is a problem that's been going on for quite some time. Um, we and you know it's 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 a complicated issue. You can't just look at social isolation, or we'd be pointing fingers at all right. kinds of people oh. that exhibit some of those signs. But whatever it is that she observed, uh, you talk about change of behavior over time. Obviously, there were some serious red flags going on back since la the last time she had because of that them. comment, David. What do you think? Yes, I can only imagine the sadness and the horror this woman oh. experienced. This was ABC News calling her, saying we've identified you as the mother of this gentleman and uh, could you comment and she said yeah you've got the right guy so she knew something was going on and what happens this gentleman's not a small child he's not he's under eight or he's over 18 right. so she's stuck with knowing that he's ill or he's disturbed uh, he's not res responding to her phone calls maybe maybe he stopped taking his medications and she knows that and she she's knows praying something. for him she knows but something. here's a situation where she knows it's going downhill fast and then she finds out what has happened it's it's a terrible tragedy for her and the family very sad we have less than a minute left I, I wanted to ask you both if you could just name me a couple of top red flags somebody who might act out violently they haven't yet um, what to be watching out for and let's start with you Wendy. You know one of the things that you've heard a lot of people telling I know David will probably agree with this but you want to look at the way somebody's been treated in the past and how they respond to it um, you know humiliation as David's pointed out what, things that uh, actually wear on someone over time because obviously this kid didn't snap. He planned, planned this, this for so many. bullying, things like that. Oh. How about you, David? What would you say is a major red flag? In some cases, such as the school shootings we've seen, yeah, pe people, young kids being bullied repeatedly and humiliated repeatedly, if they begin to socially withdraw or make threats, that would be a, a big red flag. In this case, um, if someone has a delusion about being special or about being a, a character in a movie, especially a violent character, or if someone who is acting this peculiarly using strange speech sp begins to uh, uh, verbalize threats or verbalize a fantasy of violence, that would definitely be a red flag we'd want to look for and get them help. All right, unfortunately, I wish we could talk more. We have to stop. Uh, mm -hmm. If that happens, yeah, help them get some help. So, Wendy mm -hmm. and David, thank you both for being here. Thank you. It's good to be here. That interview was recorded earlier today. As you heard at the beginning of the newscast, the attorney for Holmes's mother says that Arlene Holmes was only confirming her own identity when she talked to that reporter from ABC News. Tonight, as we mourn the death of Sally Ride and remember her efforts to get young people involved with science and technology, we look at a summer program here in San Diego teaching the teachers. KPBS education reporter Kyla Calvert has the story. That whirring is the sound of success. About 20 high school teachers from states ranging from Alaska to Florida are in a San Diego State classroom learning to write computer programs that tell gears when to turn and lights when to shine. They're part of this summer's class of trainees for Project Lead the Way. The national nonprofit develops engineering, technology, and biomedical curriculum for middle and high school students. That's your negative 127 is where you start. Jen Klusinski is spending her second summer in San Diego training teachers to deliver the engineering curriculum. What we're doing with the training right now is getting the teachers prepared to go into their classrooms and use the equipment and use the programs and be prepared to answer questions that their students might have so that they can go in and feel confident in what they're actually teaching. What sets the courses they're learning to teach apart is that they're project-based. That means instead of lecturing to a class, teachers will help students use the formulas and skills they learn to build things like circuits, robots, and hydrogen batteries. Rancho Bernardo teacher Lisa Barnett is new to the Project Lead the Way curriculum, but she has been leading her school's robotics team, so she knows what effect hands-on lessons that end in working machines mean for her classroom. In my classroom, that means that um, I get more one-on-one -on -one 
uh, time with each kid and, and get to celebrate with them when they experience something that works. And she's seen that applying math and science to solving real-world problems accomplishes another goal that's important to her. I have always been really strongly motivated to try and get more women into science. And this is uh, one way that I know that we can attract more girls to take science classes. Once Barnett and her fellow trainees master the programs they've been testing out, they'll put the gears, switches, and sensors they're learning to control into robots like the one San Diego State engineering professor Bruce Westermo shows off from a previous class. So just learning the basics of uh, machine control, system design, and uh, programming. And so they're writing the programming that says, you know, when you push button Exactly, you know, push this forward and the right or the left wheel goes forward. I see. Uh, you know, hit this button and the motor turns it one way so it drops the arm or raises the arm. Westermo directs the engineering curriculum training and agrees with Barnett that Project Lead the Ways courses target students who might not otherwise consider going into tech fields. This is not an honors program for just the brightest kids. The top 20 percent, they'd probably go into engineering or technology anyways. What this program does is help to grab that middle 60% of kids, kids that never saw the relevance of algebra or calculus, but when they see it applied to something and why you need to learn it, it suddenly opens them up. Opening more students up to fields like engineering matters to California companies like Qualcomm and Chevron, which sponsor Project Lead the Way in California, says Westermo. We need to grow our own workforce, uh, and it's part of the reason I think it has been popular in California, because it's really hard to hire someone from Iowa or Nebraska to move out here to try and buy a house and to meet this standard of living. But if we can attract the kids that grew up in San Diego, train them to fill those jobs, they're going to want to stay in San Diego, and they, they more likely will. Westermo says Project Lead the Way's courses are being offered at 375 middle and high schools in California, which get the curriculum for free but have to pay for teacher training and materials. Students from those classes become eligible for scholarships at SDSU School of Engineering. There are about 30 scholarship recipients at the school now. Westermo says the performance of Project Lead the Way students in other states bodes well for their success. The students that have gone to, say, Rochester Institute of Technology out of the New York program, uh, they, are, uh, they have about a 90% continuation ratio for the students in engineering. 90% of the kids that start will finish. At a typical university in engineering, it's 50%. A track record like that is one of the reasons Poway teacher Roger Dome says he asked his school to send him to the Summer Institute. There's so many kids, they say, quote, I'm going to be an engineer because my dad or my mom was or my friend was, and then they get in and they drop out. We don't want that to happen. We want the kids to be successful. Teachers trained at SDSU this summer will go back to their classes prepared to show students what goes into producing that satisfying sound of success. KPBS education reporter Kyla Calvert. You can learn more about the project Lead the Way online at pltwcalifornia.org. Friday's shooting in Colorado has renewed debate about gun control. California's gun laws are among the strictest in the country, differing from California's in several key issues. California prohibits owning assault weapons purchased after 1989. Colorado allows assault rifles. Background checks are required in California and come with a 10-day wait to purchase handguns and rifles. And in Colorado, background checks are only required at gun shows. Colorado gun owners can also carry guns openly. That is illegal in California. Peggy and her guests now have more on gun regulations and their impact. In California, suspected cinema shooter James Holmes could not have legally owned the military assault-styled rifle he used in the Colorado movie shootings. But the 12-gauge shotgun and both Glock pistols he had are legal in both states. Here to talk about gun regulation is Lori Saldana, former California State Assembly member and legislative author of the Open Carry Law. Also, Alex Kreit, a professor at Thomas Jefferson School of Law. Thank you both for being here. Lori, tell us why you devoted so much time in the legislative office of, of trying to um, mm -hmm. handle guns. Well, it was one of uh, a dozen bills that I carried in my final year in 2010. We had some very active advocates for open carry in San Diego. Law enforcement had some very, uh, I thought, justified public safety concerns. So I worked, they, they, it became law enforcement's priority bill for 2010. 
And it really was a matter of public safety and making sure that people who were openly carrying unloaded handguns in California uh, were not uh, creating an unsafe situation for people around them. Okay, and Alex, gun control advocates uh, maintain that ownership um, is okay because the uh, Second Amendment right uh, allows us to, uh, to our individual right to own this. But a Supreme Court decision in 2010 came down that really affects us. Can you tell us about that? Yeah, uh, the uh, U.S. Supreme Court in a pair of cases, 2008 and 2010, said that uh, the Second Amendment does provide for an individual right uh, with regard to guns. But uh, those cases are pretty limited. Uh, they talked about an individual right to have guns that are in common use by law-abiding citizens for personal protection in the home. So uh, they didn't talk about, you know, uh, the right to carry guns out in the open, in public, in schools, in, you know, government uh, facilities, or the right to have unusual types of weapons, uh, automatic weapons, that kind of thing. What kind of impact do you think that could have on um, state law? Well, it, remember, the Second Amendment says a well-regulated militia. So regulations are appropriate. The Supreme Court hasn't overturned that. Uh, we have 50 to 60 gun deaths every day in the United States. And 50 I, to 60? Yes. Mm -hmm. And so I think when we have these extreme situations as we had in Aurora, people start paying attention. But the fact is uh, nearly three times that number of people die every day in the United States from gun violence. So it is something that's going on every day, but we pay attention to it when these extreme examples occur. And it was extreme. Now, gun regulation is such a political football. Um, <laughs> I have heard actually at least two commentators say that if the victims in the movie theaters had their guns, if everybody was armed, this would have never happened because they would have fought back. Let's start with you. Did do you, what do you think about that statement? I mean, I think, you know, there's just no empirical evidence to say when you're in that kind of a chaotic situation that more guns is going to somehow lead to less violence. Uh, if you have somebody that's well-trained, maybe it's a different situation. Mm -hmm. What do you think? An off-duty law enforcement officer who went through tactical training on how to disarm a shooter in a dark, smoky room maybe would have had a chance. But I think the average gun owner doesn't have that type of training and more guns create a more unsafe uh, situation, not a safer one. And I, w I was looking, I was scouring for evidence to see if, but and, and the only evidence I found even on um, police records were basically that typically it's an untrained person with a gun is the, the victim of their own gun. Often that's the case, especially if the assailant is larger and stronger and can disarm a person. And some of the open carry people were ha actually having people know that the gun was not loaded and taking the gun away from them with an armed gun so, or with a loaded gun. So. Uh, you're right. They're more likely to become victims of uh, crime at the hands of their own weapon. That's what I found. The NRA is uh, NRA is notorious for aggressive lobbying against gun controls. Um, can, can both of you address maybe uh, what is their top arguments for re less regulation? <laughs> Where do you want to begin? <laughs> yeah. I, I'm just thinking. You know, they, they you have the right to carry a weapon. Okay. Now, yes. they, but they don't want it regulated. Okay. They, they were a soft opposed to my bill because they recognized open carry was something that was not regulated, and people were often carrying them without having training. So um, I think they're getting now into some campaign finance laws. They made the Disclose Act in the Senate a priority bill of theirs last week. So uh, I'm not sure what their priorities would be, but they they have the aura of safe gun ownership as as their baseline. And yeah. what do you think? And I think that is true. It's one of those things where I think uh, sometimes they uh, message and focus their message on safe gun ownership and things that I think a lot of people agree with uh, when in reality some of the positions they're taking are a little bit more extreme than that. And so I think it's one of those things where the message might be a little bit different than what they're actually doing in terms of their legislative or efforts. Or maybe the individual members. Now, the accused um, shooter, he had, I had heard at 1.6 thousand rounds of ammunition, but enough, a, a lot of ammunition. Um, how have laws around buying ammunition, how have they changed since Columbine, since uh, some mm -hmm. of these other ones? Let's well, Kmart discontinued sales of ammunition after the Columbine shooting. It took some prodding, but they, they discontinued selling any ammunition in their stores. Um, other uh, stores have different policies. We now have micro-stamping of ammunition in California to help law enforcement and forensic investigations of shootings. So, But the ammunition is something that is not covered under the Second Amendment, so more states are going in that direction to limit access to large quantities of, of ammunition. All right. Unfortunately, we've run out of time, so uh, thank you both very much for joining us. Thank, thank you. you.
In tonight's Public Square, we hear from you about the California Parks scandal, where officials discovered the department hid nearly $54 million in surplus money for years, even as parks were threatened to close due to budget cuts. The director resigned and a deputy was fired on Friday over the incidents. Kim Nemitz wrote this about it on Facebook. If one department can hoard $54 million for 12 years, who else is playing the same tricks of deceit and thievery? Dave B.'s Facebook comment is, This is exactly why I'm against any tax increases until I feel comfortable that there is no more slack left in finances. Eva Tho had a more positive post. She wrote, At least the money is there and hasn't been stolen and can go towards keeping some parks open now. Kind of like finding some forgotten money in an old pair of pants. Doesn't make their accounting very trustworthy, though. You can join in on this conversation or any others you've seen here on KPBS by following us on Twitter, liking us on Facebook, or email us at publicsquare at kpbs.org. You can find tonight's stories on our website, kpbs.org slash evening edition. Thank you for joining us and have a great evening.